Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Commerce Connections. I'm your host, Catherine McQueen, and tonight we have our special guest here, Senator Maddie Hunter, and we're going to be talking about breast cancer awareness. Good evening, Senator Hunter. How are you? Good evening, Catherine, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, Senator Hunter, tell me something. Can you give the audience a little uh, background history uh, of your uh, bio and tell them yes. what you're doing in our communities in, as far as breast cancer awareness? Yes, I can, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I've served in the Illinois State Senate representing the 3rd Legislative District since um, 2003, so next week would be four years, which is two terms that I've served as a state senator. And I currently serve the uh, s uh, serve as chair of the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee, yeah. Senate Appropriations Three Committee that funds education and economic development, to name a few in, in my committee. I also sit on the State Government Committee, the Health and Human Services Committee, Housing and Community Affairs Committee, and Pensions and Investments. Oh, that is really wonderful. So let me tell, yes. let me ask you a question. What have you uh, come across with the uh, disparities in, um, in health care as far as African Americans and especially geared toward women in, in the uh, uh, underserved communities? Well, um, in terms of health disparities, uh, Catherine, I've gone around the country as well as the state talking about health disparities. But really, health disparities and other types of uh, uh, dispar disparities have a lot to do with inequities, such as um, um, inferior education, um, uh, poor housing conditions. Uh, it has a lot to do with social conditions. It has a lot to do with polluted environments, you know. And if you put all of those together, um, then you start talking about inequities, inequalities. Uh, for poor people, you know, it doesn't matter whether they're black, white, brown, but they're poor and, and based upon the environment based in which they live, based upon the education, the school that they attend, the area that they live in, Basic, it, 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 it dictates the type of education they'll receive. It dictates, it dictates the type of um, health care they will receive. It dictates whether or not you're going to have a high incidence of asthma, for example, you know, because um, in poor communities, people are not getting the types of services that they really need. And then we wonder why we have a high rate of crime in our communities. Um, it has a lot to do with why uh, Johnny cannot read. Yeah. It has a lot to do with poor um, education funding in, in poor communities throughout the country, you know. And so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about inequalities. So, so inequalities meaning also that uh, would these people be receiving, if they went to receive medical treatment, Mm -hmm. then would they receive uh, the best medicines as well? It depends. Um, I think that if you compare, what you need to do is basically compare, um, let's take a, a, the south side of Chicago, for example, which is part of the district that I represent. Uh, I would say that the health care would be different if, if, if a person were to go on the north side. I see. Or the northwest suburb, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Same thing for education. You know, if you do a comparison between South Side, West Side of Chicago, healthcare, education, can comparing it with uh, Northwest Side. Oh, so okay. So with education and healthcare, then would you say that we, uh, the professionals that work in those areas in the healthcare field and educational field, would they be? like substandard to what they need in that neighborhood? Or? Um, I think that the, the employees, their training is good. Okay. You know, but I just think that it's the level of care. For example, you have, uh, in, in health care, you have like a shortage of res, reg, re, registered nurses. I see. Okay. In the, um, in the poor communities as, a, as compared to a higher number of, of RNs and other staff supportive staff uh, on the, the, the northwest side or, or other parts of the state, you know. Uh, same thing for um, uh, education. You might have um, uh, better trained maybe or, or more teachers or smaller classrooms on the northwest side as, as compared to poor communities, uh, south and west sides, you know, where you have like 
40 kids in a classroom, yeah. you know, with one teacher. Yeah. And you go like to the northwest side where they might have small classrooms, uh, 10, 12, 15 students where, in which, you know, the teacher can focus more on the students. They'll get a better uh, outcome, you know, in terms of test scores and uh, better tutors and, and those kind of things. So then, so you think that if, uh, if part of the problem, if they had better education, they would be in tune to their health, uh, 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 being more tuned to get better health care? I think that, I think so. I think that we'll, 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 we'll be better in tune with better, knowing how to better take care of ourselves if we had a better education. Mm -hmm. If we had a better education, we could get better jobs in mm -hmm. our communities. Mm -hmm. If we had a better education, we could live better. You know, we, 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 we wouldn't settle for less. You know, we would begin to uh, not accept what everything, that, what everyone tells us. Mm -hmm. We would start questioning uh, the conditions of whatever, you know in order to make our life and our family uh, conditions better, you know. For John. Mrs. Sayers? Because it just may come true. What are you doing here? You wished for someone to explain cancer the disease, so here I am. What do you know about cancer? After 15 years as an American Cancer Society volunteer, you'd be surprised at how much I've picked up. You mean I could have gone to the American Cancer Society and avoided this class? Don't feel bad. Very few people really know what cancer is. Ooh, and from the looks of these notes, I have arrived just in time. <laughs> oh, Jonathan, I would have thought that by now your handwriting would have improved. Oh, or are you studying to become a doctor? It's just that this class is a lot harder than I thought it would be. Besides, I've just decided to drop out so that I won't hurt my GPA. Hey, what will your mother say about that? I'm in the wrong class. I don't want to be a doctor. I just want to understand what my mom had. I mean, look at this course outline. John, did you know that in 1913, the cancer survival rate was only 10%? And today, nearly eight decades later, the survival rate is up to 50%. Yes, that's good. That's very good. But the subject is not an easy one. So you're telling me that smarter minds than mine are still learning? Come here. Here, look into the microscope. This is a normal human cell. Your body is made up of trillions of them. This is DNA. DNA is the blueprint or programming within each cell that tells the cell what to do. Within this DNA programming are the instructions when to duplicate and then divide to make new cells. Now, look into this microscope. These are human cells that have transformed into cancer cells. For some reason, their programming has gone wrong and they are dividing uncontrollably. As these cells divide, creating new abnormal cells, they take over the immediate area of normal tissue to form a tumor. An important side note, a tumor is a mass of cells which may be benign or malignant. Now, take a look over here. These cancer cells have invaded the bloodstream and are traveling to other parts of the body where they don't belong. This process is known as metastasis. What about all these other terms like oncogenes and oncogenesis? Well, let's figure them out. First of all, onco means cancer. And genesis is the, the beginning. Right. Oncogenesis is the beginning of cancer. What about malignant and benign? The doctor used those terms a lot with my mom. Malignant is another word for cancer, while benign is a tumor that's not cancerous. And you were ready to drop out. <laughs> what about oncogenes? Cancer of the genes? Now remember, in every cell, the DNA works as the blueprint. Physically, the genes are made up of individual strands of DNA. When one of these genes malfunctions, it can trigger the transformation from a normal cell into a cancer or malignant cell. So what are the types of cancer? Well, there are over a hundred different diseases that are called cancer. We can group or classify these diseases into four basic types, depending upon the cell or tissue of origin. Carcinoma arises from epithelium, the lining or covering tissues. 
like a cancer arising from the lining of the cervix is squamous carcinoma. A cancer arising from glandular epithelium is an adenocarcinoma. A malignancy arising from supporting tissue is a sarcoma, such as bone cancer or osteosarcoma. Lymphoma is a cancer arising in lymph nodes. Hodgkin's disease is a good example. And cancer of the blood cells is called leukemia. What causes cancer? Does it have to do with heredity? Oh, there's no doubt that heredity can play a role. But you have the potential to control your own cancer risk. Your lifestyle, such as nutrition, the use of tobacco, exposure to the sun, are all factors. Look at this person. This cancer started in the lungs. 80% of lung cancer and over a third of all cancer deaths are caused by smoking. And the other thing that may have as much impact on cancer deaths as tobacco is poor nutrition. Okay, I can live without smoking, but I can't live without eating. How do I know the right foods to eat? The American Cancer Society has developed nutritional guidelines. For example, watch your fat intake. Stay away from fried foods. Remove the skin from chicken. Eat meat in moderation and eat lots of fruits and vegetables. A high-fat diet seems to be related to the risk of developing breast, prostate, and colon cancer. Also, try to eat foods high in fiber, like whole grain cereals, beans, lentils, prunes, apples. These pamphlets will give you a long list. A high fiber diet may reduce your chances of developing colon cancer. Over half a million new cases of skin cancer are diagnosed each year. You should use a sunscreen with a high sun protection factor or SPF. Wear protective clothing and avoid direct sunlight between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. when the sun's rays are the most hazardous. The sun's rays, tobacco, viruses, anything that causes a gene to malfunction and induce cancer is called a carcinogen. If cancer is detected in its early stages, the survival rate increases significantly. Early detection means regular checkups for both men and women. But especially for a woman, this means monthly breast self-examinations, pap tests, and clinical breast exams. As for a woman over 40, this also means regular mammograms. And you know, John, it's only because of literally decades of research that we know these things. Research to find a cure, and equally important to ease the suffering and to prevent cancer. Over its history, the American Cancer Society has invested over $1 billion in cancer research. I wish my mom had known about the American Cancer Society, and they had known about her. You're right, John. Cancer is more than information and statistics. Now, let's go through these steps one by one. A mammogram is a low-dose breast x-ray that can identify cancers too small or too deep to be felt. By piercing the mass or tumor with a needle, it can be determined if the tumor is solid or liquid filled. A biopsy is a procedure where part or all of a tumor is removed and examined under a microscope by a pathologist to determine if it is malignant or benign. In determining the appropriate cancer treatment, a doctor will first consider the type of cancer. The second consideration is the stage of the disease. The stage of the disease is classified as localized, still confined to the organ, regional, outside the organ but still in the immediate area, or distant, when cells are breaking away and traveling to other parts of the body. The third consideration is the physical condition of the patient. And finally, the patient's consent is always obtained before treatment begins. Forms of treatment include surgery, which is used whenever possible to physically remove the malignant tissue from the body. Another treatment option is radiation. This treatment utilizes high-energy x-rays focused directly on the malignant area. More than half of all cancer patients are treated by radiation therapy. Chemotherapy is the use of chemical medications. They are given orally as well as intravenously to treat cancers that travel through the body as well as localized tumors. Chemotherapy is prescribed alone or in conjunction with surgery or radiation. Another form of treatment is immunotherapy, which modifies the immune system. What about all those awful side effects? Both radiation and chemotherapy attack cancer cells when they're most vulnerable, when they're dividing. 
Unfortunately, the treatment isn't totally selective and will also attack other cells that rapidly reproduce, like hair follicles and the lining of the stomach. Fortunately, if a patient does have side effects, they will end when the treatment ends. So in the underserved communities, are you seeing uh, a rise in cancer in, in a, as, as a whole? I, I think so, yeah. Uh, not only cancers, but anything dealing with health. A high increase of diabetes, asthma, um, cancer, hypertension. You know, everything in the poor community is the highest of everything, the highest rate of obesity. Everything is high, 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 you for, know. For, for, for the minorities? For minorities, and I think a lot of it has a lot to do with access mm -hmm. to, um, to health care. So, you know. so the programs that they have in uh, place to help the people in the minority communities, are they actually working or, or the people are not taking advantage of them? Or do you think uh, with the educational level that the people have, they don't really want to take advantage of what's offered? I, I think that people need help out here. Mm -hmm. uh, people are suffering out here. However, I believe that if people had a higher level of education, they would better understand that if you, um, you see, we are the first ones who know what's going on in our body. We may not know exactly what it means, yes. you know, but we know that normally if, if a head hurt, if I, we have a headache, it might be a different kind of headache, you know. Uh, uh, we might have some heart palpitations, you know. But we're so afraid to go into the doctor at the very beginning yeah. of any kind of condition, and we wait to the last minute, and next thing you know, we run into the emergency room, whereas had we dealt with it when we first received any kinds of signs or symptoms, mm -hmm. you know, then we, we could have gone to our physician and that would have reduced the, the low cost of, of health care, you know, it could possibly um, save a life, mm -hmm. you know, but we're so afraid that we might have a deadly disease or something like that, that we always wait until the last minute and by the time um, we finally decide to go into the doctor, go in to see the doctor or go to a hospital, we're half dead, or the condition has has increased, and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we're at critical stages at that particular time, mm -hmm. you know. Well, do you think that part of the reason why uh, a lot of people are so apprehensive, especially uh, African Americans and minorities, as far as going to doctors, they, they feel that they're being experimented on, or they, yeah. they don't feel that they're getting uh, yeah. the right medicine in the first place, yeah. and uh, they only feel that a, a Band-Aid is being put over the cause. So, so what I'm saying mm -hmm. is, is uh, just like uh, Dr. Whitaker, he has uh, Project Brotherhood in, 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 in place right. where they have African-American doctors to mm -hmm. help African-American men. Absolutely. So do you think that there will ever come a time when we would have something in place for African-American women, especially bringing their, do their children to the hospital, where they would have uh, maybe more African-American doctors or minority doctors mm -hmm. that they could, they feel uh, that they could trust? Yeah. in order to come to the doctor and that these people really want to help them. Yeah. Saying, do you think something like that could ever be in place? Yes, um, there are programs mm -hmm. out there for women, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that uh, it is our responsibility as legislators to work with the Illinois Department of Public Health um, and, and various city and township housing uh, health committees and, and, and health organizations to establish these programs for women. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are bits and pieces of it, small pieces of, of programs, you know, but it's not enough. I see. And uh, we really need to do a better job at it. Okay.
far as senior care, are there programs in in intact for for seniors? Yes, in the minority community. There are increasingly more programs for seniors. I see more programs for supportive and assisted living facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you have many churches who are now building new facilities and you have other health care organizations that are out there building uh, new facilities um, or taking abandoned um, buildings. buildings, warehouses and grocery stores and renovating them for, for our seniors, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I must say that um, we are doing, we are making progress Okay. in terms of addressing the issues of seniors. So now what can communities do as far as helping to uh, bring health care facilities that are needed to their, 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 uh, their area in right. Illinois? If they need right. something, do they need to band together and you know, write maybe a petition and everybody sign it and send it to their uh, senator of that district and say, listen, you know, we're here, we need X, Y, yeah. Z. Yeah. There's a number of ways, but of course, uh, petitions are a very effective way of communicating with elected officials. Mm -hmm. uh, some people can just pick up the phone and call their elected officials and get an appointment, or sometimes they can actually uh, talk with them on the telephone, um, so you can go th that route. Uh, some people write letters, some people email elected officials, you know. Mm -hmm. So there, and some people um, uh, communicate with their elected officials by way of um, town hall meetings and those kinds of things, you know. So there are a variety of vehicles in which um, the community can contact their elected officials to make them aware of what the needs are in the community. So now you've been working on a new project here with breast cancer, correct? Yes, I have. Okay, and yes. tell me, first of all, tell me, what are you seeing in the communities with breast cancer? Is there more uh, African-American women dying from breast cancer, or are they surviving more in the year 2006, 2007? What do you think? I see us having a great number of women who are dying. However, on the other side, I see a number of women who are getting in to see their physician, um, early enough. Um, I see women getting in earlier, an, an earlier now getting mammograms, but we still have a long way to go. There are too many women who are um, being uh, diagnosed with breast cancer at a later stage. And what we're trying to do is get more women to get in earlier uh, to, because uh, early detection is the key to survival, you know. And um, if women could simply give their own self-examination, mm -hmm. you know. You yes, know. because I know the, they, the old um, examination was to make circular motions around the breast. Right. But now they have a new technique where it's like mowing the lawn mm -hmm. and you actually go up, up and, and down, down on the breast right. because they're saying that you would be able to find more lumps if you mm -hmm. go up and down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But here, uh, here is a situation though, uh, I believe some women are really afraid to find out if they... Oh yeah, that's one of the major problems. That's why we wait so late to go in to see um, our physician is because we find a lump and we say, oh my God, mm -hmm. I have breast cancer, you know, and we're self-diagnosing ourselves rather, as opposed to getting in there and actually talking, uh, going in there and actually getting examinations and, and letting our physicians who are the experts to, to, to examine us and check us out to see what's really going on. Mm -hmm. I know that my, myself, I have very, very, very lumpy, thick breasts. Mm -hmm. And so I make sure that I get in uh, every year for a mammogram. And um, it's, I always have a concern, but I also um, administer self, self um, Exam. exams myself, you mm -hmm. know, uh, to see if I can catch anything before anything happens, you know, that, that, I, that I have no control over, I you know. See. But I just think that I know that there's a lot of ladies who are out there and young women who are out there who are uh, notice a change in the breast. In their breasts, mm -hmm. you know. Now, when you say notice a change, what are we looking for? Well, we can look for for a uh, discoloration of the of the Oreo of the Oreo. Mm -hmm. You know, we can uh, just notice some lumps. You mm -hmm. know, um, swelling. Swelling. Some some women might have um, 
um, some some mucus coming out or okay. you, you know what I mean yeah and, so, I, and I also heard that uh, sometimes women's breasts have caved in yes yes so, so any kind of change that you notice in your breasts mm -hmm. pay close attention to your body mm -hmm. that's the most important thing about everything because it's telling you something. it's telling you something and so I know you could be quite concerned and quite afraid but you got to remember the earlier you get in there, yes. you're saving your life okay. because you don't know what it is. Right. And you know How soon can I see him? Jennifer, why don't you remember him as he was? I want to see him, Miriam. All right. I've booked you into a hotel near the studio. And why did you write me for an appointment with the doctor? He's already told you everything he knows. It's not about Tony. It's for me. It must have been a shock when you discovered it. But lots of lumps mean nothing. I mean, some are only cysts, aren't they? Yes, but this one wasn't. The doctor took a biopsy and was malignant. Oh, Jen, I'm sorry. It's pretty hard to take. Tomorrow they have to perform a mastectomy. Doctor says it's not the end of the world. He says lots of women live long and happy lives after successful breast surgery. The point is to catch it in time. I'm sure they will, Jen. Afterward, you can come to the beach with us and recuperate. No, it's funny. All I've ever had was a body, and now I won't even have that. Oh, Jen, now stop talking like that. Well, Lion will find you a job. I know he will. And, honey, let's face it. All I know how to do is take off my clothes. Jen. Hello? Yes, I placed a call to Milwaukee. And I'm all right. Really, I am. Run along. I'll stay with you tomorrow. And don't you worry. Bye. Bye. Hello, Mother? I had to talk to you. There's something I have to tell you. I talked to a uh, nurse the other day, and her name is Sabrina, uh -huh. and she uh, takes care of cancer patients, and she is called the wound care specialist. Oh, okay. And they were doing the dressing on uh, a, an African-American woman who had breast cancer, mm -hmm. and they went to change the, bre the, the, the dressing, mm -hmm. and the breast came off 
in the dressing. Oh. And I thought oh. to myself, how, uh, you know, terrible. Mm. I mean, this, this thing is really, really something. Yeah, it so, is. It um, is. Uh, and basically, I think we need to know about it because, you know, who wants to, to die from something that might have been preventable? And have supportive services in the state of Illinois for oh, people yes. suffering from breast cancer? Yes. How would people who have breast cancer, especially in the underserved communities, what yes. would, how would they find out about these supportive services? Great question, Catherine. Uh, you can contact um, uh, the, the Illinois Department of Public Health. They also have a web, you can go into the state of Illinois website and, and hit the Illinois Department of Public Health mm -hmm. and Women's Health, and, and, and there are a number of supportive services that they're, that they're offering. Also, the American Cancer Society has a number of, of, um, of, of supportive services. And also, you have some supportive organizations. There's a group out there called Sisters, Why Me, Coleman Foundation, those are out there. You have, there, there are, these groups have walks with encouraging family members to go out and walk to raise money for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, it's a great thing. Uh, I know Salem Baptist Church had a walk over the summer and they raised dollars, you know, for breast cancer. And I think it's a wonderful thing that people are rallying behind this issue because it's such a dreadful disease. It's, it's devastating to the individual as well as to uh, family members. So, yes, but there are supportive services that are out there. Say, for instance, somebody is diagnosed with breast cancer and they yeah. have to have their breasts removed. Mm -hmm. Are there organizations in place to help them do reconstructive surgery, especially if they're minorities? They don't have money to pay for that. So, I mean, they do don't they have just monies. lose the breast? Or, can, uh, or do you have organizations that will help with reconstructive surgeries? Well, first of all, if a person uh, is diagnosed with breast cancer, mm -hmm. the physician will direct them to the right place. They will direct them to various hospitals. They will direct them to the American Cancer Society who has monies yes. for a number of different kinds of programs and supportive services. The Illinois Department of Public Health, they actually fund various kinds of programs and initiatives. So people don't feel as though there's no hope. Don't feel as though there's no place to go. There are plenty of places to go. You contact two major organizations that I know of that I know you can get immediate help from and that's the American Cancer Society mm -hmm. as well as the Illinois Department of Public Health. Now they also fund various organizations in which if you go on their, those two agencies' websites, they'll list out who they fund and where you can actually go uh, nearest your home for help. I see. So don't feel as though you're isolated and that you're the only one out there who is experiencing this problem because it's not true. There are plenty of women out there, unfortunately, who um, are, are, are being diagnosed, but they're getting help. Women are living longer, mm -hmm. Catherine. They're living longer. Than that's, they were before. That's right, because because they they got in there early enough and they were detected early enough. Okay, well look, now, look this is out, this is a uh, breast implant. Yes. This is by Mentor Incorporated. Mm -hmm. And this is the new breast implant that has been approved by the FDA. Yes. Silicone. Yes. And so, I just, do you want to feel that? Yes. Okay. But my point is, is, is that like if a person needed the reconstructive surgery, mm -hmm. would the organizations be willing to, you know, do the implants? And here's another one. Now, this is the one where they actually put the saline in. Oh, okay. Well, you know, a lot of this has a lot to do with the physician. Mm -hmm. Your physician will, will give you recommendations and options, mm -hmm. and it's between the patient and the physician. Right, because see, what's going to happen is a lot of women, if they think they're going to lose their breast, yes. and then they just have flat chest, nothing there, Right, they're going to want to know, well, well, I don't have any money, so what can you do to, to make my self-esteem, sure, sure, uh, uh, sure. the level of the self-esteem uh, come back to right. the normal level that I had it when I had my breast. If not increasing your self-esteem. Yes, uh, there are a number of products that are out there on the market for women today. 
uh, women no longer have to suffer the way that they've done in the past. You mean like to do just go and buy a, a bra that had a... Yes, yes. Okay. There are options out there for women. The key is getting in there and start talking to people, asking questions. Mm -hmm. Just ask for help. Somebody, they'll help you. Just ask they'll for help. help. Ask for help. Just ask for help. And then if they can't get any help, they should call their who? Call to the... If they feel as though they're just walking into closed doors. Or getting the runaround. Or getting the runaround. Mm -hmm. Call American Cancer Society. If you do not have that phone number, you can dial 411 Directory Assistance and they will direct you to the nearest um, American Cancer Society organization in the, in the area in which you live. And you can contact the Illinois Department of Public Health. Cook County Hospital also have a um, breast cancer uh, program for women. Mm -hmm. and, and check local hospitals in your area because many of them have now, now have uh, breast cancer programs that you can, you can contact. And they'll help you even if you don't, do not have any monies. Um, the Illinois Department of Public Health and the um, American Cancer Society has programs for women who do not have any money. Previously interviewed Dr. Whitaker in the year 2003, and he touched on uh, the different health care initiatives that were going to be put in place for the uh, Illinois area. So today when we talk to Dr. Whitaker, he's going to give us again a little brief background on his bio, his educational experience, and what has happened or transpired in the time from 2003 to 2006, and bring us up to date for the Illinois Department of Public Health. Dr. Whitaker? Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity again. And it's been three years. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it seems just like yesterday. And, you know, we, we've been really busy. And, and it's, I have to tell you, from a personal perspective, it's been a lot of fun to work for Governor Blagojevich. He has a number of different priorities. Health care is one of them. So despite us having a $5 billion budget, and that's with a B for the state, uh, our department's budget has grown as we've done new and different sort of programs. All right, now the uh, governor just recently expanded, expanded the program on breast and cervical cancer, mm -hmm. and the program is called is, uh, IBCCP, the mm -hmm. Illinois Breast and Cervical Sorry. Cancer Program. Uh, can you explain to the viewing audience what that is going to do for the women in Illinois? Sure. Uh, the I IBCCP program, the whole idea behind it is that y you want to get folks into to screen for these two cancers that, that are preventable the earlier that they get screened. And IBCCP is, is based on incomes because most women who don't have cash, don't have insurance, mm -hmm. are, are not able to get access to the screening. And, and they look like our women, you know, a lot of them. Yes. Uh, and so what the governor did, there were, there were two things about the program. One, that he expanded the, the amount of income one could have to to uh, be in the program. So if you, you know, before, if you made $40,000, uh, you could be in the program and had a family of four. Now it's $50,000. And the second thing he did was, you know, there, there was, uh, uh, you know, the way the program was set up is that you had to be screened in the IBCC P pro program before you could uh, uh, end up getting treatment in the program. And if you got screened, like in some community place that wasn't in, in the IBCCP program, yes. most people would end up having you come back through the program and get screened again All right. so that you can have access to the, the free treatment at the end. Mm -hmm. So this allows people, women, to come into the program whether they were screened in the program or not. And we save money by not rescreening people, yeah. and we also save time because you're not putting people through another exam that they didn't need to get them to pay off of uh, free treatment at the end. And, and, and that, you know, and that's the great thing about IBCCP is that in the past you used to have screening and then women would find cancer and we wouldn't pay for treatment. Oh! <laughs> so it was a cruel hoax that, that you'd help women find that, that they had a... a, a find lump. out that they have the cancer. Said, and then you said, good luck, uh, take care <laughs> of yourself. But uh, because of the wisdom of the legislature mm -hmm. uh, in, in the past, now you know you get free, Medicaid picks up the cost of treatment for oh, women who come through the program. That's so this, this just expands the pool of women uh, and we currently, uh, you know, screen about seventeen or thousand plus women a year on this program, and this will expand at another three thousand.
Now, let me ask you about uh, the, there's a new um, lottery program going mm -hmm. on for breast cancer. Can you tell the viewing audience about that? Uh, sure, sure. And th this, again, deals with uh, breast cancer prevention. And it's called Ticket for a Cure. Mm -hmm. And Senator Emo Jones, President Emo Jones, had it actually be Senate Bill Number One. So it was the first bill that came out of session a year ago. And the the idea is that, that you buy a ticket, and the funds from the ticket will support activities related to breast cancer prevention. And so we we've collected almost three million dollars from the ticket from a year ago. We're, and we just launched the second ticket for a cure this year. And the money could be used for women who need screening. It could be used for support services like for breast cancer survivors. Uh, they may be a part of a support group or, you know, for transportation, other support services. So, the, and, and lastly, the other important thing is it can be used for research. Because ultimately, we want to get rid of all of this. You know, we talked about HPV. Yes. The, the, the vaccine only came about because someone was in a lab working to do the research that made that possible. And so the funds from this will also help fund Illinois researchers in trying to find a cure for breast cancer. Okay. Now, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the women who are at greater risk to die of breast cancer who are uninsured? Well, the, the, the issue uh, with all cancers, but I think particularly for breast cancer and for cervical cancer, is that the earlier you get detected, the better outcome you have. If you, you find, you know, the, uh, breast cancer has four stages. If you get found in stage one, you have an 80% plus chance of survival. It may be even 90%. Oh. So the earlier you find you get detected, the, the better. And what happens in terms of insurance is that you put off, you put off, you put off <laughs> going to seek needed yes. care because you can't afford it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what, why, you know, places like Cook County um, Bureau of Health Services, the, the county hospital, is a great thing for the state of Illinois because people at least have some, some place to turn. In a lot of major cities, you don't have that public health system. So it's, it's critically important that women have access to services, uh, as, you know, poor or not, early in, in terms of uh, screening as opposed to later because as, you, as the time goes on, there's less you can do about it. And that's true for HIV, that's true for breast cancer, that's true for most everything. Can you uh, give the telephone number to the uh, IBCCP program? Uh, sure, sure I can. It's in the stack of papers <laughs> also. Um, and, and, you know, the thing, thing to note, th this is not only, the number I'm going to give you is not only for the IBCCP program, but, but also for any women's health uh, programs that we might have. And I am trying, I think it's at the bottom here. Uh, it is Women's Health Line at 888-522-1282. And let me say that again, 188-522-1282. And that should be on the top of my, my brain, but it's, as you can see, my brain is filled with a lot of things. All right. <laughs> so. Well, well you, you, you've certainly been working, Dr. Whitaker, and I want to thank you so much. takes us to this breast cancer lottery ticket. Yes. Um, last year, mm -hmm. um, uh, President Emil Jones, who was the president of the Senate, we got together and he said, Hunter, I want you to introduce this lottery ticket for women. I said, well, what does it do? He said, it, it'll raise monies to fund breast cancer prevention Pro and research projects. And this is it, the ticket for This the is an cure? oversized ticket. This is how the actual ticket look. Mm -hmm. And here you have an oversized um, uh, sample of the ticket. And 100% of the proceed goes towards breast cancer. Mm -hmm. It's a scratch off lottery. It costs $2. It is the only lottery ticket dedicated to breast cancer in the entire country. I see. We are leading the way for breast cancer in terms of ra raising funds for breast cancer right here in the in state of Illinois. Illinois. In and the so, state of Illinois, that's, that's right. right. So other states can take on to this as well. Absolutely, that's why I've been traveling all over the country, making different legislative bodies and different women's organizations mm -hmm. aware of this lottery ticket. Because what happens is that dollars are limited. Mm -hmm. And um, um, what we're trying to do is uh, African-American women and Hispanic women has the highest rates 
of breast cancer because we're the, we we are the ones who are, are least likely to go in and, and, uh, and, and ask for a, an examination. An examination. Mm -hmm. So what we tried to do was to try to figure out how can we raise additional monies outside of what is available through private organizations and what's available through government. Mm -hmm. So we came up with the lottery ticket and thus far you see that three million dollars at the top that yeah, says current, current total, total proceeds. Total proceeds is three million dollars. That's right. Since this lottery ticket has been on the market uh, since January 9th mm -hmm. of 2006, we have raised an astounding three million dollars. Right, and as a yes. matter of fact, you had opened up, uh, you were gonna give out grants, as a matter of fact. That's right. And and that deadline for the grant uh, application was December the 11th, correct? That's right, this past Monday. Oh, That's you right. know, very yes, good. Yes, 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 because very we good. went down there, as a matter of fact, we okay. had an idea of how to get the information out to the communities. Mm -hmm. So now, so now the three million is in, Right, and they opened up the uh, request the grant. for proposal. That's correct, and you had to get that information in. Plus, even if it opens up again, uh, audience, let me just tell you this: they want new, innovative ways to distribute this money to communities, organizations, uh, and organizations. That's right. Too. And and what happens is that there are three areas in which services can be provided. One is research, mm -hmm. which mostly your public and private organizations can bid on those organizations. Uh, th those that research project also uh, promoting awareness and education mm -hmm. now those are two of the most important keys in my opinion is promoting awareness and education because what happens in terms of promoting organizations and a not-for-profit organization can respond to a request for a proposal now as you indicated uh, Catherine the deadline for the first round of requests or, or of the proposals was due December the 11th. That's right. Okay, so that deadline is it's gone over. and it's over. So when will the next one be? There'll be another one uh, probably around March or April of next year. That's that's okay. That's good. And so so let me just let the view, viewing audience know. So they're going to open up uh, grant applications, be sep accepting grant applications again probably in March of 2007? Or, or the spring. Okay. Yes. And then this money is going to, uh, these grants are going to be funded through the Ticket for the Cure. Ticket for the Cure. The, the bill that I passed was Senate Bill 1, which is called Ticket for the Cure. We have a statewide advisory council called Ticket for the Cure. Mm -hmm. The ticket in itself is actually called Ticket for the Cure. And uh, we have the dollars that go into um um, this fund that is called also a ticket, ticket for, for the, the cure, cure. <laughs> and those are the dollars in which we'll use for uh, the, dis the to dispense to non-for-profit organizations that are in good standing with the state of Illinois. So they have to be non-for-profit? They must be non-for-profit or private organizations can apply for the funds. Mm -hmm. But I encourage, strongly encourage grassroots organizations to apply for the funds uh, because what we want to do is get the monies out there to the people. We want your organizations to go from door to door to find women. You can find them in churches and other kinds of venues throughout the state and uh, find out whether or not they've had a, a mammogram. Uh, if not, you can p take the money and pay for mammograms. You can get a free mammogram from Cook County Hospital. You can get one from St. Bernard's Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, you can contact the American Cancer Society, Chicago chapter, and other chapters throughout the state of Illinois. They have dollars for, for not only mammograms, but supportive services. Do they have mobile service at all now? There are, there are mobile services also. Uh, that are they? They don't have as many mobile units as 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 we really need as we as we have right now. We need more. Okay. Okay. But there aren't that many at this particular time. However, um, uh, we're working in conjunction with the Illinois Department of Public Health, and they um, um, have a women's health division in which a number of different services for women mm -hmm. are actually coming out of. Um, uh, that department, that, that, that particular department. But I also want to say something really, really quickly, and that is men are also today Catching being diagnosed with breast, breast cancer. cancer. So I don't want you all to think that only women are, are being diagnosed with breast cancer. Men are as well. And men, you can, you can, give, you can have self-examinations as well. If you find in your breast, go to the doctor.
immediately. Right. Now, you were at the uh, luncheon when they had Diane Carroll, Ms. Yes, Diane I Carroll, was. the actress there. Yes, I And was. she talked about her experience with breast cancer. Do you remember right. some of the things that she talked about in regards to breast cancer? Uh, uh, she was tremendously depressed and she had stopped eating, but um, she talked to a few comp a few friends in confidence mm -hmm. and they talked her into going into the doctor, mm -hmm. get checked out. That's when she was really diagnosed as, as, as uh, having breast cancer. And all of her friends who were so caring and so loving, they supported her mm -hmm. throughout the entire ordeal. My personal experience with cancer began at the age of 63, on 29th, 1999. I went in for my annual check, oh, don't figure it out, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> After returning, I visited my doctor once again for a sonogram. I was not worried. I was not concerned. I thought I just have an extremely cautious doctor because my family record was fabulous and my lifestyle was very, very healthy. Maybe too many long hours, but very healthy. So we did the sonogram and I was detained for a very long period. Each technician presented to me a quote of cliches to quiet my building anxiety. So don't worry, Ms. Carol, everything's fine. But we'd like to take you in and just photograph you from another section, another side. So each time I was becoming more and more nervous. But my nervous system would not allow me to relax. And I thought, hmm, I see. This is how it feels to slowly become absolutely terrified. <laughs> this is how it feels to be trapped and alone, and not know what to do. Finally, the x-ray technician told me, I'd like you to come to my office for a moment. So it began. I don't know if it was the tightening of the screw, or... I'm usually very good with denial. But we had to place a call to my doctor. We did. And I just couldn't believe what was going on around me. It was decided that I needed a second opinion from a surgeon. Yet no one had spoken the word cancer. Just this little gray mass. That's what they just kept talking about, this little gray mass. I left the doctor's office that day absolutely convinced they had made a mistake. Again, like so many of us, I'm very good with denial. But denial was becoming very difficult. The surgeon examined the x-ray and he found a cloudy area, he called it. So now I have two names. I have a cloudy area and I have a gray mass. <laughs> I finally said, is this malignant? We won't be able to diagnose properly until it is removed. But we are concerned with this cloudy gray mass. Two physicians and myself decided it was best to perform a lumpectomy. All of this happened very quickly in a few days. One of my dearest friends, Dorothy, from Palm Springs, was with me. She stayed waiting for the result, and she taught me how important it is to have friends. She stayed just because she didn't want me to be alone when I received either a yay or a nay. And naturally, just as she pulled away, the phone rang the doctor. And he said to me, the good news is that your lymph nodes are clean. The other good news is that the cancer you have is very small. It's less than a centimeter. He went on to say that I was very lucky. In my case, even though the tissue that they took from my breast was malignant, my lymph nodes were clear, and that was very important. He began to discuss radiation treatment, the length of the uninterrupted time that would be necessary to complete the radiation, 
the necessity to rearrange my life to accommodate this five daily treatment. Strange to look in the mirror and talk to yourself about things like this. And I looked in the mirror and I said, what would Dominique Devereaux do? <laughs> But eventually, you forget even thinking about it. Like many of you, I was told from the time I was born that looking well, being attractive, is very important. It was very important to my mother. My mother got up every morning and Shirley Temple curled. I was supposed to look attractive. So eventually, the radiation treatment ended. I have now had a very positive checkup. And now, I must tell you, I feel amazing and well. My energy level is very high. If you can find a way to help your friends, your family member with their fear and denial, do it. And I want to thank you very much. This has been my honor. Remember that if we're not caring for people doing the work that you do, many of us would not be here today. And I hope to live to come back to visit you another time. Thank you. Well, just to uh, ask you some quick questions, and we're going to wrap this up. Uh, are there going to be any more bills passed that you're trying to work with in regards to uh, breast cancer awareness? I don't know. What we're going to do is uh, we're leaving the door open right now. We're not going to say no right now. Okay. What we're going to do, this lottery ticket, Ticket for the Cure, mm -hmm. is, it will be on the market for six years. Oh, that's great. Okay, so, so, so it will be on the market until 2011. And based upon this lottery ticket can stay for 20, 30, 40 years mm -hmm. as long as you, the public, continue to spend $2 for this lottery ticket. You continue to, to buy the lottery tickets and we continue to take the monies and put them back out into the community for services. Then that's the key to the survivability of this lottery ticket. So right now we're going to see what happens. Uh, what I'm finding out is more women who are much younger. I'm, I'm running into women who are 15, 16, 17 That years. are developing breast cancer? Yes. yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. So, um, so anyway, we're playing things by ear. We're taking in as much information as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And we're evaluating the entire matter to see if we need to do anything else. Uh, legislatively as it relates to breast cancer. And so can you tell the viewing audience how you got involved with this uh, breast cancer program? Well, I have a, um, I became uh, concerned about the breast cancer subject matter because I had, a, I lost a sister-in-law who was diagnosed and, and uh, she, was di she was diagnosed too late. Mm -hmm. She was frightened, she was afraid, she was in shock. She did not get the help that she really needed uh, when she needed it and did not know where to go, where to go. And you know, pro having eating the proper diet, exercising, you know, a lot of that stuff has a lot to do with it as well. Taking care of ourselves, taking control of our life. But you must uh, be in, in, you must work with a physician. You can't do it by yourself. Okay. So there's no excuse, ladies, That's none, right. what, and men. There is none whatsoever. So, so, so Senator Maddie Hunter has said there is no excuse. We have to, they're helping us to fight the cause. That's right. So we have to help them and be able to go and buy these uh, ticket for the cure. Right.